You are tuned into another edition of Lockdown Royals on the Lockdown Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. Let's compare this rebuild between the Royals and the White Sox. Brad Keller is back, but why? And can Nick Prado fix himself and his approach in the offseason? I'll tell you all coming up next on Locked On Royals. You are Locked On Royals, your daily Kansas City Royals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for tuning in to this Wednesday edition of Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Jack Johnson. You can follow me on Twitter at Johnny J underscore 15. That's at J O H N Y J underscore one five. And be sure to find all of our podcasting platforms on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just be sure to hit that follow button and subscribe. We're about 15 or so subscribers from 500. We're going to make that the goal before the end of the season. And then hopefully by the time spring training rolls around, we can get to 1,000 subscribers. But of course, a long ways to go. So let's just set that milestone at 500 for right now. If this is your first episode ever tuning in to Lockdown Royals, of course, welcome in. I'm just a lifelong Royals fan like you. I just turned that fandom into a career path. And I now work in Kansas City at Sports Radio 810 WHB. I've got daily shows on ESPN Kansas City, Monday through Friday, and once a week on Sports Radio 810 WHB at night. Actually, we'll be on from 7 to 10 this evening, so trying to get this podcast out to you as quickly as I can. But if you want my thoughts on anything but the Royals, or maybe a little bit of Royals sprinkled in there, you can always catch me there. But the easiest place to find all that, just go to my Twitter page at J underscore 15. Right now, the Royals are going to be wrapping up their series against the Chicago White Sox, and I really did think it was a good time to evaluate where both these teams are at and which side you would pick uh, to be with. Because I think for a lot of pessimistic Royals fans, a lot of negative Royals fans, the easy answer would be, well, I want to be a fan of the White Sox. I love watching Luis Robert play. You have Dylan Sees. Um, you've got Yoan Moncada. You've got Eloy Jimenez. You've got Oscar Colas, who's a young outfield prospect. You know, you've got young guys coming up through the system. But overall, I think when you look at Chicago, is they are a team that has a lot of talent. We have saw that two years ago, three years ago. But the problem with having a lot of talent like that is sometimes, not all the time, sometimes you have guys with big egos. And big egos don't always mesh in a locker room. Now, you may ask me and go, well, Jack, would you rather have talented guys with big egos or would you rather have guys who aren't as talented, but they mesh together? I don't know. I kind of think there's pros and cons to both sides here. But what we've seen from Chicago in their window of contention, if you will, is a lot of underachieving. I mean, you've got guys that have more talent than anybody in the game. I think Luis Roberts, one of the most talented guys in all of baseball. He's showing it this year, but injuries were always a problem for him. You know, when they had the infield of Yuan Moncada, a former top prospect, you know, Tim Anderson's won batting titles. A second base really didn't matter, but at one point they had Nick Madrigal before trading him to the other side of Chicago to play for the Cubs. You know, they've had Cesar Hernandez there. This year it's been a revolving door. Sosa's been there, Josh Harrison in the past. First base, you know, you had for a long time Jose Abreu. And, and that's more of an underlying part of all this. I think this White Sox team is is so bad this year because they lost their captain, they lost their leader. And and Jose Abreu, and I think he really gelled everybody together. But the other problem with Chicago is they've gone through three managers in the last three to four years. You know, you had uh, Renteria managing the team, Rick Renteria. Then you had Tony Larusa, which didn't make sense. Then you pry Pedro Grafol from the Royals, and it's kind of been the same result every single year. Maybe not wins and losses wise, but kind of falling flat on your face. So if you ask me, who would I rather be? Well, which organization is heading in the right direction, I would say at this point in time, I would take Chicago's talent, but I would not take their structure because the White Sox have funneled out a lot of money to guys who just didn't pan out. Uh, they spent a lot of money 
to keep Luis Robert there, decided not to trade him because they feel like their window's still open. They gave a lot of money to bullpen guys, Joe Kelly, Kendall Graveman, Liam Hendricks. Now, Liam Hendricks, that's an outlier situation. I mean, the dude was battling cancer. He's an absolute bulldog. He's a guy I root for all the time, not just because he's a former Royal pitching back for that uh, rotation sparingly at the end of the year 2014. People forget that, but it's because he's fun to watch. Uh, he's got a lot of flair, and he's a guy that I'm bummed that I didn't get to see play much at all this year. But what the White Sox did is they went all in. They spent a lot of money, brought in Yasmani Grandal. That didn't work out. You know, they gave a big contract to Eloy Jimenez. That really hasn't worked out. So structure-wise, payroll-wise, I'd rather be in the Royal shoes because you have a lot of guys right now that just are on rookie deals. Your superstars, Bobby Wood Jr., Cole Reagans, and Michael Garcia, are all cheap right now. You haven't given them extensions, whereas the White Sox have already committed to that. And they hung on to Dylan Cease, who took a big step back this year. He was a Cy Young candidate last year, but taking a big step back this year. I mean, there's a lot of problems going on. There were stories leaked about the locker room problems. You know, there's a lot of tension between the fan base and ownership. I mean, you have to sell the team signs. They haven't gotten that yet in Kansas City. There's been tension, but it's not gotten to that point just yet. So talent, like I said, going back to this piece, breaking this down piece by piece. Talent-wise, I think I'd take Chicago's roster because there's more proven commodities there. I mean, offensively, and you've had a great major league season from Luis Robert. You've had good offensive production seasons from Eloy Jimenez before and Andrew Vaughn. Um, you've got a true ace of your staff that, yes, took a step back, but it's proven I'm a Cy Young-type pitcher in Dylan Seeds. No longer have Lucas Giolito. Michael Kopech doesn't seem to have it anymore. Now, you gave a lot of money to Andrew Benintendi, and that is one kind of like the Eric Hosmer deal for Kansas City, where I'm glad the Royals just didn't give him that. You know, in the end, it's going to bite them in the butt. He hasn't been that bad this year. He's kind of just been, you know, what he was for Kansas City, maybe a little bit worse. But giving out money when your window's not really open anymore. So the White Sox have committed a lot of money to a lot of different guys that either are no longer playing for them or they are playing for them and underachieving a little bit. And here's another part of this is that the Royals, you know, they've gone through three managers since 2019. You had Yost in 19, then Mike Matheny, 2020, 2022, now Matt Quattrero. So manager wise, you know, you've committed to a couple different guys. I think when you look back, you know, Tony Larusa was a bad hire for Chicago, not win loss wise. They made the postseason, but Tony Larusa was not the right guy to manage that group of guys. You know, I think that White Sox team goes a lot further if they have a an Alex Cora at the helm, somebody they can relate to. You know, I always think that you know on the National League side of things, you have a lot of managers that make sense for teams. You know, I think Lavello makes a lot of sense for Arizona. I think Skip Schumacher, surprisingly, makes a lot of sense for Miami. Younger manager, Rocco Baldelli, makes a lot of sense for the Twins. I know it's not the National League, but younger managers. You know, it just fits. You know, A.J. Hinch may not like him because of the Houston Astros scandal, but he fits Detroit. He fits that team. Tony La Russa never fit the White Sox. And Pedro Grafol, I don't think, really ever did either. Now, Rick Renteria, kind of, but he struggled handling a lot of the big egos. In Kansas City, you know, Ned Yost, just was dealing with the rebuild, the first part of it. Mike Matheny was the wrong guy for that spot. And then Matt Quattrero, I think the jury may still be out. You know, it's not been good results so far. You've lost 100-plus games going to break the franchise record in losses for a single season in year one. But I've always taken the stance of, I want to see what it looks like early on next year. If you're heading in the same direction, then maybe you got some more problems on your hands. But I think the Royals and White Sox both look at that manager in the middle, La Russa, Matheny both former Cardinals managers, just wasn't the right hire. It wasn't the right move at the right time. But I think I would take the structure right now because you're really starting from ground zero. The White Sox are kind of caught in between of, do you want to rebuild? Do you want to sell pieces? They kind of half and half it at the trade deadline. They didn't completely tear it down, but now they have guys that maybe don't want to be there anymore. I promise you, I'm not just saying this because we're a Royals podcast here, but the Royals haven't committed any money to their long-term pieces yet. Now, that can be a problem a year from now where you don't have anybody locked down because then we're going to have the same cycle. But I'm curious what this team looks like 365 days from now. 
you know, who's to, who's been added to extensions, you know, what pieces you bring in the off season, which pitchers are still here. That all is kind of unknown. The White Sox need to figure out at some point in time, do you tear it all down, start over, start selling pieces in the off season, or do you try to rebuild it again by going heavy in free agency? Cause right now they're kind of stuck in purgatory. The Royals know they're at the bottom floor. You got to work their way up. Curious your guys' thoughts, though. Just let me know on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. Or respond in the YouTube comments. I try my best to get to those uh, when I have the time. So if you have commented, I promise you at some point I will get to your question or just your opinion in general. But let me know in the comments below. Coming up next, we are going to talk about Brad Keller. Folks, I have no idea why he's back in this bullpen. I'm not sure what the Royals are trying to achieve at this point when you have other guys in the 40-man roster who deserve a shot, I think, in these final two weeks. We'll talk about that next on Locked on Royals. You are tuning to Locked on Royals on the Locked on Podcast Network. Again, I am your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. Before we go any further, let's give a shout out to one of today's title sponsors in FanDuel. I know the NFL season is in full swing now. We are gearing up for week two tomorrow night, Thursday night football. So go to FanDuel because they have incredible offers for America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers can bet $5 and get 200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Plus, all customers who bet $5 will get $100 off NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Now is the best time to join FanDuel. The app is easy to use, and you can bet on everything from spreads to player props and more. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season with an offer you won't want to miss. FanDuel, the official partner of the NFL. Brad Keller made his first appearance since May the other day in game one of that doubleheader. And I think a little part of me was happy for the player, Brad Keller. I think it is a really mentally taxing thing to go through a type of rehab process that he went through. You know, you're looking on social media, seeing people you know, talk poorly about you. You know, I've definitely had my fair share of criticism for Brad Keller. Uh, this year, it was an absolute disaster. You know, he's walked, I believe, 70 guys this year between rookie ball, double A, triple A, and Kansas City. You know, and he's thrown less than 100 innings. I think he's thrown around you know, 60 to 65, had 70 walks. In less than 70 innings, that's jarring to me. But yesterday, he came back, and I don't know what I was in, expecting. I don't know if I was anticipating a, a much different Brad Keller. I really wasn't. I didn't have these high expectations for him. But to me, it felt like this was his chance in a, a really a lose-lose spot. You know, Even if he pitched really well, I don't think Kansas City was going to buy too much into it. And if he pitched poorly, he pitches poorly. It doesn't look good. He didn't look good yesterday. He didn't allow any runs, but he walked two. And if it wasn't for, I believe it was Salvador Perez behind the plate, you know, gunning somebody out, trying to steal second, then I, I don't think he would have gotten out of that inning because he walked the leadoff guy, guy thrown out at second, he walks the next. I mean, you're dealing with first and second, nobody out, and you can't even find the zone. It's going to get pretty ugly from that point on because his last outing, Remember, back in May was in San Diego when he walked eight guys. And he spent all his time in the minor leagues. Didn't correct anything. I mean, I'm sure he, he tinkered with some stuff, arm slot, mechanics, working with the lower body, working on footing, certain pitches. But it never got better. And my question, at least I would want to ask J.J. Piccolo. I would want to ask John Sherman. I would want to ask Matt Quattro, everybody involved. Why? Why does he need to be back up in Kansas City? What are you hoping to see? I get it. The bullpen is completely taxed. You need arms out there. But there were 40-man roster guys that I think were deserving for at least a shot for two weeks. At this point, you shouldn't really care about minor league numbers. And I know that sounds a little bit you know, ironic because I just said that Brad Keller's minor league numbers weren't very good. But we saw what Brad Keller had at the big league level this year. It wasn't good. In fact, it was very poor. Then you have somebody like Jonathan Bolin, who, no, doesn't have great numbers in AAA, but he's somebody eventually you need to figure out what he can do. And I thought it was a great opportunity to get him up to Kansas City for the final two to three weeks of the season. Now, I wouldn't 
lock him into a bullpen spot. It wouldn't it would give him a guarantee. But Brad Keller coming up to Kansas City at this point in the year just didn't make too much sense. And I know that he's not going to be out there for high leverage spots. He's just really there for you know, some relief in that bullpen. And I'm not meaning relief as in giving you productive innings. I mean relief as in guys just need help out there. Now, you can only rely on so many guys to get through this season in which you've had the second worst bullpen ERA in all of baseball. You traded away one of your more reliable guys in Scott Barlow, your best guy in a role this Chapman months ago. So I get it. You know, this bullpen's tax. You just need to get something from some guys out there, whether they're on this roster next year or they're not. But Brad Keller's a guy that I just don't think is going to be there next year. So why not give it to somebody else? who maybe has been pitching better of late in AAA Omaha. I mean, you gave John McMillan a chance. You gave Steven Cruz a chance, who was the opener today, tonight, I should say, against the Chicago White Sox. A power fastball. I know there's not many guys left in the system that have that type of life to the fastball. Will Klein uh, certainly would be a guy you'd want to, but he was just activated off the injured list, so health could be a concern there. But seeing Brad Keller back out there and doing the same old, same old, it just didn't make me feel good. It really didn't because at that point, you're just bored watching the Royals pitch in that game because you have guys out there that just aren't going to be a part of it. It's why I also I was a little bit frustrated that the Royals went from Jordan Lyles last night to Taylor Clark, who somehow is still a setup guy, the fireman, whatever you want to call him, for this bullpen. Now, Taylor Clark I don't think is going to be on this roster next year. I've already said I don't think Jordan Lyles is going to be on this roster next year, even though he's under contract. you got to make moves to get guys like that off your team. And Brad Keller getting this chance, good for him sticking with it. Like I said, I'm rooting for the player, Brad Keller, but for the team aspect, don't know if I can get on board with this. So that was one thing that just made me scratch my head a little bit. Not sure why Brad Keller is back in Kansas City. To wrap up our show, we are going to talk about a guy that – has caused some controversy on Twitter when we've gone back and forth about it. Some of you believe Nick Prado is a long-term fit and should be this team's first baseman. I, on the other hand, don't know what more you can expect from him. And can he really be a 150, 160-game player? Well, we're going to dive into that next on Locked On Royals. You are tuned into Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. I'm your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore 15. Before we wrap up the show and talk about Nick Prado, want to give a shout out to one of today's other title sponsors in Jace Medical. Modern medical care and treatment are important, but our global supply chains are fragile. Things like pandemics, natural disasters, and foreign travel may cut you off from the treatment you need. Jace Medical is your solution. Just fill out their online form and one of the board certified physicians will review to, it to determine whether medications are safe and appropriate. Then they will send you your prescriptions to one of the partner pharmacies where your Jace order will be filled and mailed directly to your home. And not only this, you can send your physician a message for answers to treatment related questions anytime. Everyone should be empowered to care for themselves and their loved ones during the unexpected. That's why Jace Medical offers the Jace case. Save more than $360 by getting these life-saving antibiotics with Jace Medical Plus, an additional $20 off by using my code Locked On at checkout on jacemedical.com. That's J-A-S-E medical.com. So be sure to check that out with Jace Medical. I know that a lot of us out there, you know, have our certain guys that we're really high on. You know, you're high on certain guys, not so high on others. I mean, we discussed this in yesterday's podcast episode. But to me, you know, the guys that I've always stayed consistent with, you know, Vinny Pasquantino, despite being out for basically the entire year, at least 80% of this year, he's somebody I've completely bought into. I believe he is a future long-term guy in Kansas City. Michael Garcia, I believe he's a future long-term guy over there at the hot corner at third base. Bobby Wood Jr. goes without saying. Cole Reagans goes without saying. Now, guys that I think are on the fence, you know, Kyle Isbell, uh, that can cause a little bit of a divide. Some people love the defense, just needs a little bit of the bat, and I could understand that. I I've come around a little bit on Kyle Isbell. In fact, I think we're seeing a little bit more value in Kyle Isbell than we are in Drew Waters at this point. 
but Drew Waters is the guy that I'm a little bit higher on than Kyle Isbell. You know, Michael Massey, you know, I think he's got great defense. He's got power in that bat. But at the beginning of the year, he was so unbelievably you know, invaluable or not invaluable, uh, had lack of value for this team. You know, he was somebody that you couldn't play every single day. And he was that bad at the plate. But now he's come around a little bit and, and gotten out of the sophomore slump. MJ Melendez is somebody that some people buy into, some people don't. Nick Prado, though, is a very interesting case. He's a former first-round pick, and we saw Nick Prado look really good early on this year. But I will say, kind of in the same realm as Michael Garcia. Now, Michael Garcia hits for average. He doesn't get on base that much. I mean, when he's getting hits, that's how he gets on base. His walk rate could get a little bit better. But what supports him a lot is his hard hit rate, his barrel percentage, his expected slugging, all of that is beneficial to him because it shows that with a little bit more meat on his bones, a little different launch angle, you have a guy that could run into maybe 10 to 15 home runs instead of three or four. You know, MJ Melendez has not had a great year. He's had a really good second half through these 51 games or so. But what really favors him is in the outfield, he may be a liability defensively. He's got a great arm. You know, baseball savant really favors the throw power that he has. And then he hits the ball incredibly hard. The walk rate goes up. You have a guy that could maybe run into 20, 25 home runs. With Nick Prado early on, even in his good stretch, the problem he still had was that the strikeout rate was way too high. And when he hit the ball, he didn't hit the ball very hard. And that's always been pretty consistent with Nick Prado. You know, he's a guy that wants to walk a lot. He's got a good approach, but not with two strikes. You know, he strikes out a hell of a lot more than he should. If you walk a lot, that's fine. If you strike out with walking a lot, okay, but that also means you have to run into about 30 to 35 home runs. You're going to be a big swing and miss guy, a big walk guy, a Kyle Schwarber guy. you got to run into 30, 35 home runs. And Nick Prado, I don't think, has that in his arsenal. And then it was, well, he's got gold glove defense. I'm not so sure he does. I don't think you lose that much value at first base if Vinny Pasquantino was there every single day next year. You know, Nick Prado's bounced around from first base to left field to right field. He's moved around. So that does benefit him where Vinny Pasquantino can only play first base. So if Nick Prado's on this roster, it doesn't mean he has to play first base. Now, defensively in the outfield, it's kind of like MJ Belendez. It's just not very good. But to me, this is one of those things where you need to kind of pick and choose who you want to build around. And Nick Prado, no, I don't think has given you that full season just yet. He debuted the last year. You know, he had a couple of months where he was somewhat hot, had the walk-off home run against Boston. But overall, now the numbers are really bad. He struck out too much. Then he came up to Kansas City earlier this year and was hitting really well, was getting on base, had a great stretch, was leading off for the Royals and liked that a lot. And then when that slump hit, that slump hit hard. Because when you have a guy striking out north of 30% of the time, you got to be hoping that he's running into a lot of home runs, a lot of long balls, or at least he's hitting the ball incredibly hard. And that just wasn't happening for Nick Prado. So the fix that he's going to need is almost altering that approach once again. You know, you can't be too passive at the big league level. You can't be staring down a strike three call right down the heart of the plate. You just can't. You know, you spit on a pitch that's an inch into the zone you know it, it hits the black it's at the bottom right corner then okay I mean you thought it was a little bit off the plate but I could live with that you're looking at pitches right down the middle I mean it's better to have a pitcher up there and swinging because those guys watch pitches go right down the middle and I don't know if he's just looking for walks up there or he's just not picking up those pitches well but we've seen these slumps and when he gets in those slumps and when he's down two strikes it's hard to imagine him you know, getting a base hit or working the count back full and drawing a walk. That's all going to come with maturity, but the clock is ticking a little bit. I mean, you're 24, 25 years old, and oh, you've got a first baseman that has already shown he's a very good offensive player. Now, he could be, next to Bobby Wood Jr., your best offensive threat next season, and he plays at your position. So where does Nick Prado fit in? Where is he going to get every day at bats? I wouldn't say a corner outfield spot. 
I wouldn't say DH, and I don't think I'd say first base. If you disagree with me, again, that's fine. I welcome it. I want the discussion. I want the interaction. And I think it's good for all of us involved. So if you disagree with me, let me know on Twitter at JohnnyJ underscore 15, or let me know in the YouTube comments below. But that is going to do it for another edition of Locked On Royals and the Locked On Podcast Network. I've been your host, Jack Johnson. You can always follow me on Twitter. Again, at JohnnyJ underscore 15. That's at J-O-H-N-Y-J underscore one five. And find all those podcasting platforms on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, you know, you can go to Google Podcasts, you can go to Amazon Music, YouTube, just be sure to hit the follow button and subscribe. But until tomorrow, you take it easy, Kansas City.